It's so good to be here today. It's good to see everybody's smiling face. How many people are happy about life? Amen? You know, there's, there's so much that God wants you to understand about the relationship that he wants to have with you. And I'm reminded every day in my life when I wake up in the morning and I put my shoes on my feet and I think about how God healed me of that bone that used to grow out the side. And I take a deep breath and I feel that uh, God is opening up new opportunities every day. We have a promise from God. We are the head, not the tail. We are blessed to the Lord. God has great things in store for each and every one of us. And I want to read something to you. You probably have all heard this scripture many times, but God says this in Jeremiah chapter 29. He says, uh, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And I want you to know that sometimes we go through a season where we go through tests. We go through a season where we go through trials. You know, every one of us is coming out of something in our lives that uh, we need to be overcomers. We need to, to go forward. We need to climb higher. But God says this. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think or I have in my mind towards you. Says the Lord. God says, my thoughts are of peace and not of evil. And thoughts to give you an expected end. God says, then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And I just want to just talk about this today because, you know, there is something that God wants all of us to have. Is Therefore, he wants you to have a bold level of confidence in him. And I don't know about you, but I'm in my earlier Christian walk with God, I never really had bold confidence. You know, I, I was a person that, uh, you know, I was seeking God, but I knew that there were some areas in my life that I, I just needed to overcome. Amen? You know, this is, you know your failures. Nobody has to remind you. And, of course, I've always said this. You don't have to tell a drunk that he's a drunk because he knows that. You don't have to tell a prostitute that that's what she is because she knows that. But what we need to do, we need to allow the love of God to shine through us that when you speak life to people, you don't have to condemn them for their failures, but you should encourage them because of what their potential might be. Right. And I know that so many times in life we have a tendency to criticize ourselves, and generally people that criticize themselves have a hard time being confident in God. But when God says, I know what my thoughts are towards you, he says that the Lord says these are thoughts of peace and not of evil. God says, my thoughts are to give you an expectant end. Uh, you know, the Bible says a wicked man is taken suddenly sometimes. And, you know, think about it. When, when you uh, go through life and you see tragedy, uh, I, I can think back. Actually, I remember years ago, some of you aren't old enough to remember this, and, but I was, and we're talking about back when I was in high school, back in uh, like right 1972, 74, somewhere, actually it would have been 73 or 74. Uh, I remember right here in Chase, right where these railroad tracks are, uh, there were some friends of mine that were in school and they were playing on those railroad tracks. And I remember coming to school one day and they made the announcement uh, that uh, some friends of ours were, were killed. And I think back, past all these years, and, and I, I remember that these kids that were killed on the railroad tracks were kids that were kind of like troublemakers in our school. I remember that. I remember they were the kids that went out in the courtyard in high school, and they were out there smoking cigarettes, and some of them were smoking dope, and, you know, they would go out, and their moms and dads would let them do whatever they wanted to go out and party on the weekends, and they'd come to school, and they'd brag about how many beers they could drink, and, of course, that was a lifestyle that they led. And I thank God that I had parents that, that protected me in that area. Uh, my mom and dad watched over me. But thinking back after all these years, and that, what happened was they were over here, right across the street. There's a railroad track right down here in Chase. And over the weekend, they were drinking, and they were playing that, that chicken game. And uh, unfortunately, one of them tripped, fell, whatever, on the railroad track, and and uh, he got he got run over by a train, and um, it's so sad because when I think back, how many years it's been, 
you know, I'm 61 years old right now, so we're, we're talking like maybe 40 some years ago. All these years, I've been living my life and that young man, his life was snuffed out in the prime of his life. And I think about that and I read this scripture and I think about what the word says and God says, I know what my thoughts are towards you. God says, his thoughts towards us is to bless you. He wants you to have an, an expected end in life. You know, to, to think about this, to, to, to be taken suddenly and, and not have an opportunity to get your house in order or not, you know, even with King Hezekiah. Remember when the Lord spoke to him out of the mouth of the prophet? You know, Hezekiah was a man who loved God. He, he really did. He was a king over uh, God's people. And, and, and God speaks to him. He says, I want you to go get your house in order. And I think that's a blessing when a man can get his house in order. Because no one's promised tomorrow, you know. But all of us at some point in life, we're going to have to say this is our last day on earth. Like it or not. You know, like it or not. There, the wages of sin is what? That's right. The wages of sin is death. And because of sin, uh, our physical body has to die. Jesus didn't die on the cross to save our physical bodies. He came here to save our soul. And that's a spiritual thing. God told Adam, in the day that you eat of it, Adam, you shall surely die. You know, it's funny. Even in the Hebrew, the word representing humanity is a word in the Hebrew. It's ha-adam. And it actually, the word Adam is in there, ha-adam which represents who we are as the human race. Uh, God said to Adam, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And of course, people say, well, Adam never really died because he lived to be 900 some years old. But God wasn't talking about Adam's day like we think. God was talking about God's day. If you'll notice, God created Adam so that he would live and never have to die. And when God said, this day you shall surely die, God was talking about his own day. That's why in 2 Peter 3, 8, it says, be mindful, or denote this, that a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So therefore, no man has ever lived to be a thousand, even in the Old Testament. You know, some of those, like Methuselah, he lived, was it 969 years, I believe, or somewhere around there? Uh, 900, some, I mean, that's crazy. No one lived to be in his 900s. And, you know, people lived long in those days, you know? And, uh, but if you'll notice that God, in his mercy, tells us that he has good thoughts. And his thoughts toward you is to bless you. And he wants to prosper you. And he, he wants you to live a full life. He wants you to live an enjoyable life. But, you know, the devil wants to come and rob, steal, and kill, and destroy. And he wants to take away life from you. He wants to take away your joy. He wants to take away your your enjoyment in things around you. There comes a time. In fact, there's many scriptures that talks about the blessing of the Lord. You know, you know the Bible says that, that if a man is blessed of the Lord, God will bless you in having good sleep at night. Did you know that? That's a, that's a sign of being blessed. And another sign of being blessed is the Bible says that when you're blessed of God, God blesses the work or the fruit, or the work of your hands and the fruit of your body. That means at the end of the day, you should be blessed with the Lord. You turn around, you look back and say, wow, look what I've accomplished. I've been able to get these things that I feel good about. It. And I don't know if you've ever had that feeling, but I do. At the end of the day, I mean, like, uh, my wife and I, we share our responsibility around the house. And, and I'll get out there and I'll work in the yard and uh, I'll, uh, I'll make sure that the grass is cut. In fact, I'm very... You know, I'm, I'm, I love my grass green. I really do. And, and me and Pastor Glenn always interact and we talk about what we do. And he's telling me, oh, well, there's this new product came out or I'm doing this in my yard or oh, it's time to put the weed and the feed down and we're going to fertilize. And, and of course, I'm doing that too. In fact, I, I, I don't want to park my car, ride my car over the grass because it kills the roots. And like sometimes like, you know, if, if there's a dead spot in the yard, I'm thinking I got to get some grass seed and fill that little patch or I'm going to kill this root. And, but at the end of the day, when I look at it, I see, well, look at all this, look at that beautiful green grass. I know that when we get to heaven, God's going to have a place in heaven for me with lots of green grass. Amen. That's okay. You can have the streets of gold, but I want a yard with nice green cut grass. There's just something to it. I love it. But you know, God knows what makes you happy. And and of course, all of us have, have things that we like. And, you know, if you're a person who likes sports, and 
And if you like baseball or football, it, it's not an evil thing. And, you know, people that get caught up in religion try to steal your joy. You know, Satan knows that the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if you can't enjoy life, if you can't enjoy the presence of God, if you can't enjoy one another, if you can't enjoy God, what, what life would become mundane? You would have no purpose. You know, it's the very fact that God gives you that joy. And he gives you these things. You know, that, that's a sign of God's blessing. And the expected end that he wants to give you is that he doesn't want you taken unawares. You know, I think back about that train wreck and that young man that was killed and how he was living his life recklessly. And I remember in school that the way he was, the way he talked, and of course, all through the years, you know, even as I got out of high school, you'd hear stories that somebody would say, you know, somebody died or somebody had an overdose of drugs or somebody, uh, I remember a young girl had cancer in high school and I remember her wearing a wig and everybody making fun of her because she had, had to wear a wig and she lost all her hair. And I, and I used to feel so bad for this poor girl and she was fighting for her life. And you had to find out these people in life and, and you turn and look back and you see everybody's dying or everyone is dead or everyone's, you know, and, and I was just listening to an interview today. In fact, one of the things that they were saying in that interview is that when a man's in his 90s, he don't know anybody his age because everybody's dying off. And you begin to think, you know, I've made it this long. You know, what is my life worth living for? What purpose do I have? God wants you to understand that there is a purpose for everything under the heavens. Ecclesiastes says that. In fact, God tells you in the book of Ephesians chapter 1 that God gives you an eternal purpose in him. And when you find out what that eternal purpose is in him, you'll understand that your hope is in Christ. And when you experience Jesus and you are able to live a life of, of expectancy, a life of blessing, a life of accomplishments, and a life of, of great exploits, then you can understand why Paul, in the last part of his life, as he, he realized his life was soon to be over. And guess what he said? He knew that God had revealed to him that he had ran the course. He fought the fight. And he knew that he had done what God sent before him to do. And at the end of his life, at the end of his days, he knew that he had accomplished everything in life that the Heavenly Father desired for him to accomplish. I believe there's no greater blessing. I believe there's no greater experience it to know that you have lived your life to the fullness and the fullness in Christ pleasing him and honoring him and doing the work that God has set before you that's why when God says I know what my thoughts are towards you you know when you think about that you know nobody just thinks you know like let's just say you're in love with somebody right you ever remember back in the day when you used to love your husband? <laughs> when you got married, he was a hero, and one day you woke up and he was a zero, right? <laughs> but you can remember back in the day, when you were in that place where you were so excited, I remember we were just talking about it yesterday with uh, Brother Jack and Sister Gitta. Me and my wife were, he said, you know, we remember a time when me and my wife held hands all the way to Tennessee and back. I mean, we were so in love that we just wanted to be touching one another. It's just to have that relationship, just hold hands. I remember I was driving this, I had a Dodge Caravan, and it, and it just had, it was like a two-seater, and she would be sitting over her seat, I'd be in my seat, and we'd reach her, we'd be holding hands, the whole way, I'm driving one hand, all the way. <laughs> all the way to Tennessee. And you know, you think back about that, you know, there's some precious moments, and, and it's not that we don't love one another now, it's just I guess we held hands so much that, that I know what her hand feels like by now. <laughs> And I'm sure she knows what mine feels like too. But 
there's something to be said about the newness of relationships. There's a newness about life. And there's a time and a season for everything under the sun. And there's a time to enjoy precious moments like that. You know, it, it wouldn't matter. You're, if you're a parent, you'll remember the day your little boy was born. I mean, he might be 40 years old right now, but he's always going to be your little boy. You remember that, you know, when that child came into the world, or maybe the first words and the first baby steps. And you think back and you say, God, these are precious moments. And when God says, I know what my thoughts are towards you, you know, that's all part of God. God says, I'm not going to just allow you to go through life and experience life and, and be miserable. God says, I've got some good things in store for you. I, I got some wonderful things. I've got, I've, I've got a husband set aside for somebody. I got a, a little boy set aside for him. God said, I'm making that little boy in heaven right now. When he comes in the world, he's going to bring so much joy. And he's going to grow up and you're going to look at your son and you're going to say, gee, I see myself in my son. And he's going to make you proud. And I don't mean it in a negative way because you know, the Bible says pride comes before fall and the Holy Spirit before destruction. We're not talking about that type of pride. We're talking about a healthy type where you just... When you love somebody so much, it's not about being prideful of yourself. You're being prideful of him for him when you put others before yourself. And there's something to be said about that type of life, that type of love. And when God gives you things, and God says, my thoughts, my thoughts, I got great thoughts for you. And God says, I'm not going to abandon you and allow you to go through life without experiencing my joy or my peace. And most of all, God says, I've got thoughts for you for you to experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you can be empowered and live a life of success. Hallelujah. Man, give God praise for that. I believe one of the greatest things as a human on earth, in relationship to God, could ever experience outside of salvation is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's the truth. Because when you think about it, God gives you the Holy Spirit for lots of reasons. Without the Holy Spirit, you're limited in ability, in the spirit realm. That's why, and, I, and I'm writing a book right now, and I haven't given up on it. You all knew that I started writing a book a couple months ago. It just takes a long time. But, you know, I believe the reason why there's so many Christian denominations in the world today is because not all churches have the baptism of the Holy Ghost moving and operating in the church the way God wants to move in his people. You know, you can taste the Holy Spirit. You can experience the Holy Spirit. But there's something about being baptized, which means immersed. The language of baptism represents an immersion. You completely, like when you immerse a sponge in a bucket of water and pull it out, that's that's what God wants for you. He wants you to be so immersed in the Holy Ghost, you're like that big old sponge. You put that dry sponge in that sop in that water and you pull it up, it's ringing, sopping wet, and it's so cool. But you leave it out of the water long enough, eventually all the water will run out. you got to stay in the presence. That's why we keep coming to church. That's why we keep breathing the Word of God. That's why we keep praying and and seeking God because we got to get saturated and we got to remain in that place where we're so immersed that God's just bubbling up and out of us. But I promise you, church, that unless you are truly baptized in the Holy Ghost, unless you're operating in the baptism that God wants you to have, you are so limited in your abilities in the spiritual things of God that even your comprehension, your understanding is limited. I believe the gift of salvation can be given to a child. You don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit to receive that. But the deeper things of God, the mysteries of God, the understanding of things of Scripture. That's why I believe there's why so many people don't understand deliverance. I promise you, if you got baptized in the Holy Ghost, you wouldn't be arguing with your wife over deliverance. You wouldn't be arguing over your friends and neighbors about it. You'd all believe and see it the way God sees it because it's by the same Spirit. You realize why we got so many churches today that have different type of teachings? is because they don't have the Holy Ghost in the church, moving in the church the way he wants. In fact, that's, I quote this all the time, but I'm telling you, the Bible says that in the last days, men would have a form of godliness. They would have a form of it. In other words, they would look, appear God. They would, 
Have a little bit of godliness. Have God's ways operating in their life. But guess what it says? But they themselves, even though they have a form of it, by their lives they lead and the things that they do, they deny the power of God. And you know what the power of God is? The power of God is the, the fullness of the gospel priest that you might receive because the power of God is demonstrated in the Holy Ghost by the Holy Spirit operating in the church, God vindicating his word by miracle signs and wonders. So it represents a church and a people that only have a form of godliness, but yet they deny themselves the blessings of the Lord because they won't allow the Holy Spirit to move in the church. Think that's what it says. It says in the word, from such, in other words, from these kind of people, from such kind of people, turn away. Turn away. Turn away from them. Because it's a shame when Jesus has to stand on the outside of his church knocking to get in. And those people inside don't even want the Holy Ghost to be moving and operating in, in the church. And Jesus stands out there and weeps. You know, you hear that little parable about Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. Well, the Bible does say that in the book of John. But you read the book of Revelation. He's not knocking on the door of a man's heart. He's knocking on the door of his church. And it's a sad thing because if he's out there, he can't even get into his own church the way he wants it. He says, I know what my thoughts are towards you to bless you. But unless he can get into his own church house, God's going to bless anybody. Paul said, if any man receives not this gospel or this word as even we have preached it, let him be. It means let him remain a curse because he's cursed already. That's what it says. In other words, if you don't receive the full gospel as Paul preached it, you're already under a curse. I don't care if you believe it 90%. I don't care if you're a 95 percenter. God says unless we, we don't live by bread alone, but by every 100 percent of his word that proceeds out of his mouth. Amen. 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 God says, I know what my thoughts are. And I just wonder if God were to come down here right now. And he would look you in the eye and start telling you his thoughts. I shared something a couple Tuesdays ago. And I, I want to share it again tonight because not all of you there were that Tuesday night service. I want to encourage you, if you haven't been out there, we're meeting over at Pastor Dennis LaRue's church, um, House of Worship, or House of the Lord Church, just right behind our, our building. And God actually showed something to me about what, what it is to be healed. And, you know, you hear me all the time talking about confession because the Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue. And God wants us to believe Romans uh, 4.17, where God calls those things which are not as though they are. So if we believe him what he believes, even though it hasn't manifested yet, if God says you're healed, even though you don't look healed, God said it, we should agree with it and, and tell everybody we're healed, right? I know that sounds crazy because people look at you and say, ah, you're lying. Uh, I remember a story with uh, uh, Brother Branham, William Branham one time. There was a man, a blind man walked up. And Brother Branham had one of the greatest healing gifts ministries in, in, in our generation, with the, well, actually the latter generation. And... Um, this man walked up to him. He was totally blind. And uh, when he walked up in the prayer line, Brother Brown prayed for him. And he says, you're healed. So the blind man walked off the stage. And he still had to have people help him get down off the stage because he still couldn't see. So a couple hours later, Brother Brown had prayed for all these other people in the prayer line. That man wanders back up in the same prayer line again. This time he approached Brother Brown a second time. Brother Brown says, well, how can I help you, sir? He says, well, I still can't see. Brother Brown says, well, you're just healed. Just go on. You're healed. So the man didn't want to be rude. He just walks off the stage. But well, he got to thinking, I got to get back in that line because I still can't see. The third time he shows up and he walks up in the prayer line. He says, Brother Brown, I don't mean to be rude. You told me I was healed two times before, but I really can't see. And Brother Brown says, don't you say that. God said you're healed. Now go out and tell everybody and believe you're healed. So the crazy thing was, that man, after that revival, 
He goes out. He's telling everybody, I'm healed. But he still couldn't see. You know, he still had his cane and the dark glasses and bumping into things. Everybody's giggling and laughing at him because he's telling everybody in the neighborhood, everybody at the street corner, and everybody, you know, he came in contact with in that little town. He said, I'm at heel. And everybody thinks that this guy's a nut. And that week he goes and decides he's got to go to the barber who's going to get his hair cut. So, of course, he walks in there, and, of course, he done told everybody in the town he was healed, he can sing. And they're all giggling at him because he's coming in like this, right? And he, he goes in, and they sit him down in the barber chair. Of course, when you're there, everybody knows everybody else's gossip and business. And so somebody said to him, and I don't know what his name was, but he just called him out by his ears. Well, I heard you wasn't married that church over there in that Holy Ghost Revival revival. when you got yourself healed. And the blind man said, yeah, I certainly did. He said, God said I'm healed and I can see. And they all broke up laughing. And they're all giggling, they're laughing, they're bust up laughing. And he says, and all of a sudden the blind man, he got real bold and he got indignant. He said, let me tell you something, I am healed. And when he said it like that, all of a sudden his eyes really opened up. And I'm going to tell you something, there's sometimes that God will test you to test you to see if you are determined enough to agree with him in spite of what things look like around you. You know, can you imagine when Pharaoh's armies were closing in on Israel and Moses is there at the Red Sea because he couldn't go any farther. There was a sea in front of him blocking them and there was Pharaoh's armies behind them. And he brought these people out of Egypt, promising them and telling them that God had spoken and said that God was going to deliver his people. At that moment, it looked like everything was going wrong. It, it almost appears as though, like, we're in trouble now. Here you done told these Israelites, you took them out of Egypt. At least there they had food. At least there they had shelter. They had clothes. And you made a promise and told them that God said you're going to be delivered and God's going to deliver you into a promised land that, that flows with milk and honey. And here you are now, and I'm sure the devil was really laughing and getting, you know, had that little demon on the shoulder, the demon on the left shoulder, the angel on the right. Well, you know, Jesus, sometimes when he talks to you and you hear him on one side, the devil's over there trying to counteract and counterfeit everything God says. Don't act like you haven't heard it, because that's what fear does. Fear challenges the truth. And, but you see, there was something about Moses. And you know, if you read the Bible, the Bible says he was the meekest man in the earth. And I think it's pretty amazing that, that here we find Moses being as meek as he was. Why do you think God chose the meekest man in the earth to deliver his own people? Because without that meekness, you would have become arrogant. You would become independent. You would become... To the point where you might become pompous within yourself thinking it's you that's performing these miracle signs and wonders. So God needed somebody like Moses who is meek, humble, and yielded to the Holy Ghost. Because when you're meek like that, you can hear God's voice. The prideful man can't hear God. He just hears his own prideful thoughts. And the Bible says at that time, Pharaoh's armies were closing in. The people were starting to see it. I guess they were sweating bullets. They're thinking, what are we going to do now, Moses? You brought us out here. And all of a sudden, it all was turned on Moses. And guess what Moses did? He took Aaron's, Aaron's rod. And he stretched it forth over the Red Sea. Because I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes the very thing that will deliver you is the very thing that will destroy your enemy. And he stretched that rod out over the Red Sea. And he said, stand and watch the salvation. See the salvation of your God. And right before their very eyes, the Bible says, at the blast of God's nostrils, God blew his nose and boom, the Red Sea parted. That's what it says. Read your Bible. That's what it says. Out of the blast of God's nostrils, he blew it wide open. And all of a sudden, Israel went across. And the Bible says, in that passage, going through the Red Sea, they were baptized. And I want you to know, sometimes in your deliverance, there's a work of God that baptizes you into his fire. There's a work of God that will baptize you into a deeper level, level and realm with God. When you go through the fire, when you go through the trial, God says, I still know what my thoughts are towards you. God told him, he says, my thoughts is to take you into Canaan land. 
My thoughts are to bless you with a land that flows with milk and honey. My thoughts are to give you the gold of Pharaoh when you leave Egypt. My thoughts are to deliver my people in whom I love. But it comes, church, with God doesn't always hand to you on a silver platter. You know, all of us at some time in our life, we're going to be tested. You think we're not going through a test right now with what's going on up there with Baltimore County came in. That, that was an assignment of Satan that came against this church. When that man came and shut our building down, I looked in his eyes. His eyes were black. And I see that all the time when I deal, do a pray deliverance over people. Sometimes it's almost like a devil looking right at you. And I found out later that a man who is a developer called me on the phone, and he knows him personally. He's a Christian. You know what he said to me? He said, that man that shut you down. He said, he is anti-church. He hates Christianity. He hates religion. He argues and he defies God. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's exactly what Satan did. He wanted to send one of his disciples down there and shut our church down. But I want to show you this. We're going to stand back and we're going to watch the salvation of our God. towards you, new life sanctuary. He's I'm going to give you an expected end. You know what that means? It just doesn't mean you're going to know how you die. God's going to say, I'm going to let you know what happens before you die. And that's a big difference. In other words, I'm going to show you. You know, when God said, I'm going to take you to a land that flows with milk and honey, he just told me he's going to take and do it. He didn't tell him when he was going to do it. He didn't tell him how he was going to do it. That all comes by faith. You know, I got myself in trouble a couple times with God, and I said, God, when are you going to do this? And guess what he says? I'll tell you what I want to tell you. <laughs> when I want you to know, I'll tell you. That's what he says to me sometimes. God, I mean, he does it in kindness. He's not being arrogant. But I'm, it's my flesh. I know, God, what do you, you want to know? Is it this year, Lord? Is it soon? You ever do that, right? <laughs> Lord, just give me a hint. Can't we, can't we just talk about you? Can't make a deal? I'll make a deal with you, Lord. <laughs> and God laughs. And you know, when he says it to me, I just laugh because I knew they was going to say that anyway. That's what he said. We have to trust him. All we have to know is that he said, I know what my thoughts are. I'm going to give you an expected end. In other words, I'm going to experience with you, God says, the blessing. Because when you're happy, I'm happy. When you're excited, I'm excited. God said, I want you to experience it because I want to bless you because when I bless you, it blesses me. I, I know that um, the scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 28, there is a, a method of touching God in a way that we can be blessed. And the Bible says that we observe to do God's commandments and we seek Him with our whole heart and we put Him first. We consider Him in all our ways. And we do the right thing. The Bible says that God Himself will bless you and you're coming in and in you're going out. I know you might not, not know what that means, but, you know, I think right now I'm not in my coming in part anymore. I think I'm on my way out period. Unless I live to be 120 years old, because I'm 61 right now. Uh, but at some point in life, you're either coming in or you're going out. God's promise is going to bless you in the coming in and the going out. And there's sometimes that you're starting out in life as a young person. Sometimes you're a middle-aged person. Sometimes you're just an old codger. But it doesn't matter where you are in life. God promises you that he's going to bless you whatever stage you are. And one thing I can tell you about people that are older is that you should never allow the enemy to discourage you because of your age. You know why? Because Moses was 40 when he started his ministry. Abraham was in his 60s when God came and visited him. In fact, actually, really, technically, he, he never really started until the promised son came, and that was... When he was 99 years old, he's fulfilled. Can you imagine being 100 years old and God said, now I'm going to start using you? 
You know? And he'd been waiting all that time. God speaks to him when he's in the 60s, but yet promise that he'd come in and God still didn't show up. Now he's 99. And Sarah is in, she's like 90, and she says, well, just go ahead and sleep with Hagar. You know the funny thing about that? Abraham never did put up a big fight over that, did he? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see one place where he argued over it. But he did it anyway, and it was a work of the flesh. But still God turned his mess around. And you know the amazing thing about that? Not only did God bless Isaac, do you know he blessed Ishmael and made a nation out of him? That's fact. That's where the Muslims come from. And, you know, I'm not, I don't fully understand why God did it that way. But, you know, sometimes if God will turn your situation around. And when you screw up and mess up and, and fail in and just, just feel like you're so defeated, God will take your areas of defeat and shortcomings and, he still says, still says, I know my thoughts are towards you. I'm going to give you an expected end, even when you've messed up. I'm going to bless you, even when you mess up, even when you fail. Even, and you know what? I'll tell you what a tough thing is. When you fail and marry the wrong person, uh-oh. You know the people out there don't marry God's perfect will. And I don't act like it always. No, and, and listen, you know, you're... Sometimes when you're young and you think this person you're married, your dream boat. Here we go. They think it's a dream boat, you know, or, or you think this is Mr. Wonderful, or this is uh, my knight in shining armor. You know, when you really get to see sometimes people, and you might be married that guy because he's good looking, and he might have a hot car, and he might be this, and you realize that you're, you're married to him 20 years later, and that guy won't go to church. You know, he won't take his rightful place in the house. You know, when you marry the wrong person, it will affect your children. If you marry a man who's not on fire for Jesus, then you're going to have kids that are worldly. It's the truth. So you need to be careful who you hook up with and who you marry. I hear an amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I, I am convinced that the large percentage of people that are married are not married in God's perfect will. They're married in God's permissive will. And God will permit you to marry anybody. He will. Because you know what? God won't go against your will. If you will to do something, he'll allow you to do it. But there's some folks out there that God has that perfect one set aside. God has Rebecca set aside for an Isaac somewhere. You know, there might be somebody here and you're thinking, I'm in my 40s or I'm getting older life. What am I going to do? God says, you just keep trusting me. I'm, I'm, I'm working on him while I'm working on you. Okay. All right? I think actually sometimes it's good to wait because if you hook up with that person before it's time, you might ruin each other. But, you know, like, you know what that's like, being married to that woman or that man that reminds you of something you said or did 20 years ago. And they won't forgive it and let it go? That happens. But you see, when you get it right, and you start living right with God and you get deliverance and you get healing. Next time when you get upset, you're going to think twice about what you say before you hurt somebody. And that's the one thing about a Christian. When you become mature and become seasoned in God, you guard your words. You guard your tongue. Because Satan, he bosses the tongue set on the fire of hell. And so many times we can say it and do something that, boy, I'll tell you what. I, I think women have a better memory when it comes to men. You know, I, I, I learned not to challenge my wife's memory in a lot of things. She'll, she'll come back and tell me something that was said or done 20 years ago, and, and I might even argue with it. The more I think about it, I say, well, maybe she's right. Because she can tell you a date or a time, or, or you ask a woman, how many years you've been married? And boy, she'll just snap that number off like it. And the guy says, he's, I don't even know. i got to think about it. And he's embarrassed to answer in front of his wife. It's because that's how men are. But nevertheless, God wants us, he wants us to have an expected end. And he wants you to be his friend. And the Bible says that Jesus says that I call you friends because a servant doesn't know the master's business. And that means that God tells you his business. God tells you his secrets. He'll tell you what to expect before it happens. And that's why I celebrate Jesus every day of my life, because I can't wait to see what God's going to do in my life on a daily basis. 
What are you going to do today? What are you going to tell me today? God, what a little secret. And God does. I, if you will tune in to God and you will listen, you can hear him speak to you. You really can. You know, a lot of times people never tune in to God because there's so many distractions. I, I've preached this so many times, but I, I mean it. The first thing we do when we get in our car, when we drive it, is do what? We turn our radio on. I bet 90% of you do it. Hey, you do it, right? First thing you do when you go home, turn that TV on. First thing you do when you go to work, you turn that computer on. Right? And your life is scheduled by all these things that you turn on. You go home, you put the food in the microwave, turn it on. You, you do this, you push buttons, and, you, and, 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 and it's all these noises. And when you walk down the street, you hear horns honking and people yelling and screaming. And you go to the mall and there's the hustle and the bustle and all the distractions and all the things. I just wonder what it would be like to be back into a simpler time. You know? I'll be honest with you. Some of the best times of my life is when I lived in Pennsylvania. I, I used to live in a little town called Gatchinville. And it was a little Amish town, actually. We had horse and buggies and had a little store that was next to me. It lived next to my house. It was like, like one of these little quaint towns. Literally, if you blinked your eyes, you'd, you'd, you'd miss it if you'd pass right through it. I don't even know you went through it. But that was, that was a simple time in my life. Actually, I didn't even watch TV that much when I lived there. I lived in a little house, a little quaint town. And a lot of my time was spent with church activities, Going next door to the little country store, hanging out there, talking with all the farmers, you know, hanging out on a Saturday afternoon, cutting the grass. Life was simple. We didn't have all the distractions. I wasn't caught up in all this craziness. But now that because of this modern age of cell phones, technology, how many of you that have a cell phone, if you leave the house without your cell phone, you feel like, wow, how am I going to make it through the day? Am I right? You see? And I'm saying all that because those things literally are distractions. And, and Satan knows that because, remember, it's an age of technology. Doesn't the Bible say in the last days men's knowledge would be increased? Do you know the Bible says that? Well, if that's the case, did you know that they, they have said that every, I don't remember if it was every three or every four months, might be three months, what we have ever learned from the beginning of history, which means from the beginning of time up until right now, three months from now will be doubled because of computers. And you know, computers right now are getting so crazy. They're, I mean, I remember a time when I got my first computer. It was a Radio Shack. It was a Tandy Radio Shack. It was it was like a 80 meg or something. So, can you imagine that? And I remember the first Pentium computer came out. It said. It wasn't, maybe maybe that was, a, I don't know what it was, but it was like nothing. It was a teeny toy. But everybody was bragging about this first paying computer. And now we got computers now. I mean, you can buy a flash drive now that go to the store for 10 bucks, buy yourself a 100 gigabyte flash drive. A little teeny thing like that, 100 gigabyte. You don't know what 100 gigabyte is? That's crazy. It's crazy. And, and I'm here to tell you, in two years, three years, four years, five years, there's going to be terabyte flash drives, and there's going to be more and more in, in knowledge and information in, the, in the, the Internet, and the speed of technology is going to go by so fast. You realize, I was going to look at the other day, the Steve Jobs introduced the first Apple cell phone, and I think it was like, I can't remember what, 1997 or something. The first Apple cell phone. Now, to me, that don't seem like a long time ago. Some of you, that might be that long. But, you know, look where we've come. And what's going to be like in the next hundred years? What is the technology of man taking man to? And see, Satan is using all these things as distractions to distract your life and, and to make you so caught up with technology. You know, the new this or that comes out, the new TV, the new bell, the new whistle, the new thing, the new digital watch. And you, you got to go and, you know, 
you just can't buy a radio anymore. Now everything's got docking station. And I don't, I don't even know how to use a docking station. You know, I just want me a radio and just plug it in, just turn the thing on. But now you've got to have a cell phone to be able to talk to a docking station. And all these crazy, and, I mean, my grandkids know more about the internet than I do. You know, I have never, ever introduced, I have never, I have never been able to send an email or a text. I've never started, you all got to laugh at this, it's true. I don't want to. In my life, I don't need that. I, I use a phone to call people. Don't text me. Don't act, don't ever, don't ever, don't, nobody ever text me. Because I don't know how to respond and, and do things back. I just never did. Don't want to. Don't come and tell. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm not interested. I, no, I don't want to know. You know why? I'm happy. <laughs> so don't make me unhappy. You know what I think texting is? I think it's an excuse for some people not to deal with somebody emotionally. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. I mean, I know, I know a family member. He was telling me he was going to break up with his girlfriend. He said, well, I'm just going to text her. <laughs> I said, well, that ain't going to work. She come banging on his door and leave him alone. <laughs> and I'm just saying this, you know. God has good thoughts. And he wants you to be in those good thoughts. And it's really up to you. It's your choice. Even though God's thoughts are good towards you, it's your choice in how you live your life. And if you're a wise person, you will embrace God with your whole heart. You really will. And those good thoughts that God has towards you, he's able to make your dreams come true. And you know that's what God wants. He wants to make your dreams come true. And you know, might not know this, but I'm going to share this tonight. Is that the dreams that you have are there because God put them in you. Amen. If you have a desire to be married, God put that in you. If you have a desire to want to be loved, God put that in you. If you have a desire to seek God, God put that in you. If you have a desire to be truthful and honest, God put that in you. And God wants you to have your dreams come true. So that's what God says. I know what my thoughts are towards you. These are good thoughts. He says the thoughts of peace and not of evil. And God says my thoughts is to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. The word hearken, that means, it's actually a word. It just doesn't mean stop. That means it's, it's a word, if you describe it in the way the Hebrew would meant it to be, if you hearken to something the way this is being explained, if you're busy talking to somebody and you're distracted by something over here, if somebody comes and speaks to you instantly, you divert all your attention to what that person is saying. You remember that time when you met your husband when you were in love and he walked into a room and the room lit up and you were all smiling and happy? Remember those days? I, I mean, or when she walked in the room, your room lit up. And you can have 100 people talking in the room, but you're in love and you're so excited about that person that everybody else, everybody's going to be chattering and talking, but all of a sudden they say something, you zone right into what he or she is saying to you, and you ignore everybody else. That's what this is talking about. God says, when you shall call upon me, when you will pray, when you will seek me, when you call upon me, you shall go and pray. It says, then while I hearken unto you. God says, I will give you my full undivided attention instantly. You have my attention. To me, that's a great thing, Amen. right? Amen. Amen. All right, give God praise. <laughs> I'm enjoying springtime. My grass is getting green. Trees have, you know, the leaves, right? Except in the last couple of days, these crazy little tassels and seeds are falling off. My whole yard looks terrible. And everybody sees and says, I go out there and get my car, and I just washed it. I look at it, and it's covered in green dust. But you know what? I got a reason to shout. Amen. I got a reason to shout. I got a reason to be excited. And I'm not here complaining about anything, I'm here rejoicing. 
And I'm here to tell you tonight, I love Jesus. I know there's people here tonight in this place that is madly in love with the Lord. God is here in this place. And I tell you right now, there could be somebody right now getting ready to get a blessing. There could be somebody right now, you came here tonight seeking God, and you need an answer to your prayer. Your answer is given. God says, I know where my thoughts are. Good thoughts. God has good thoughts for everybody. God has a great, great, great plan for your future. He is your future, and every plan can be found in Him. Amen? All right. With this, we're going to come to you right now. We're going to, we didn't take an offering last week uh, from Pastor Steve, Pastor Todd, and from Maranatha Church. It was Easter, and they just told us, they said, well, you know, they didn't feel like they wanted us to take an offering, but I, I do want to take an offering tonight, and this proceeds this offering 100% will go to uh, this ministry here that was so kind uh, as they opened up their doors and been so gracious and they've even allowed us to go back there and use the equipment and, and uh, even our praise and worship team up here using the equipment. I, I think our praise and worship team did a wonderful job today, right? Good for cheer. Father God, we just thank you for this day and the service that we had this place, Lord. We wish you to bless each and every person to meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, Amen. God bless you to discuss. Amen.